done this song before, but <clears throat> it kind of ties into Robert's scripture tonight because especially in these trying times where you've got social media, everybody is somebody where they're not. They're, they're, it's not real. It's not reality. They can be whoever they want to be on social media. So this song is like being true to yourself. Be a difference maker in the world. So without further ado, just get it started.
service and we're three weeks from Christmas and as I started looking at the scripture and started preparing for tonight I wanted to to look at the timeline that was laid out and, and looking at John the Baptist and then next week about Mary and then following that Jesus and the, I want to read the story at our communion service I just want to read the Jesus the Christmas story before we have communion but tonight I want to talk about modern day John the Baptist. And I want to look at the life of John the Baptist and I'm going to challenge you with some things and we're going to make some comparisons. But I, I'm really excited about the fact of who we are in this body and how much help that we are to people that are around us. I'm excited about that. I'm amazed every week at people that ask for help than ask for spiritual help, spiritual guidance. I got a call from a pastor friend of mine that asked me if I would just stop what I was doing and pray with him because he's really struggling with some things right now. And part of me was like, don't you understand? I have an agenda. I, this is my, my day to do these things to prepare my sermon and get everything ready. And I went and I said, no, I put my stuff down. And I went into my bedroom. And we had a grandson last night, which is just always a pleasure. And I remember talking with him today and I knelt down beside my bed and I began to pray for him. Guys, we can talk about doing something or we can do something. We've got enough people talking. Talk's cheap. What we need is people that are going to get involved and be just like Cam said, a difference maker. Now, if you know anything about the life of John the Baptist, he was absolutely a difference maker. And when I realized, I looked back and I was putting slides together this afternoon, I looked back and had Cam at Special Music and Difference Maker, and I just laughed. And I knew that this was the will of God because Robert's scripture set it up. Then here comes Cam putting this in, and then here comes the word. And you know when God gets involved because it's line upon line, precept upon precept. So we're going to start tonight with asking this question. What was John's purpose? Isaiah 40 and 3 says this. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. How many of you believe this right here? That God's timing is everything. Amen. How many of you believe that? How many of you have seen it over and over in your life? I can't tell you how many times that I've fretted, that I've worried, that I've been disgusted, that I've been anxious, that I've been all those kinds of things. Only to look back on every one of those incidences and thinking, what's the big deal now? Because I'm on this side of it. So God's timing is everything. Watch this. In Luke chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. And you will have gladness, joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall not drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. You need to understand this is talking about John. This is not talking about Jesus. This is talking about John the Baptist. And it's the timing. Now pay attention. 
When we bless our children, one of the biggest mistakes that we make is we fuss at them more than we bless them. Tonight, I got a, a text from someone at Starbucks, and y'all know that I hang out at Starbucks. I used to quite a bit. Not as much as I used to, and they fuss at me for not being there. So I get fussed at for being there and for not being there, so you guys get it, right? One of the guys that I've known for a long time, he used to work there, and he doesn't work there any longer. He, he's just there a lot. He sent me a message tonight, and he said, Howie, I need your help with something. There's a young man here, and he appears to be homeless. I heard someone speak about him. He looks like he's about 16. Someone came in the other night and was talking with him. This is all in his text. Some men came, someone came in the, in the other night and was talking to him and called him a worthless, you can figure the rest out. They thought there was going to be a fight in the store and the man walked out. Come to find out that man was his father. He had just thrown this 16 year old boy out of the home. This man's texting me saying, what can we do to help? What he was actually saying is, can you help? And I wanted to say, I'm busy right now. I'm trying to walk. I was loading the trailer actually when this came. So it was that getting ready to come here. And I'm like, God, I really don't have time to fool with this. You ever been like that? You ever had your own agenda running and just felt like, you know what, I ain't got time for that right now? I want you to look around, guys, and I want you to think about somebody that's not here tonight. And I want you to put it in your heart to contact somebody that you don't see tonight. I know it's cold outside. Robert came in. He was the snowman today. Actually, Jack Frost, literally. He, he was in a parade and about froze himself to death today. And he came in the door and he said, I'm just, I'm so cold. I watched as people came through the door tonight and they were cold. It's tough when it's cold. It's tough when it's hot. But you're here. And I thank God for each and every person that walked into this room tonight. But I want you to look around and I want you to take it upon yourself to think about somebody who you're not seeing right now. Give them a text. Give them a call. Send them a message. Give them some encouragement. Amen? Amen. So when we bless our children, I want you to look at how the father of John the Baptist blesses him. Luke Verse, or chapter 1, verses 76 through 77. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. When I read this, as I studied for this today, tears were just flowing out of my eyes because I'm listening to a father who couldn't have children. It was an old man. His mouth was shut. He couldn't even speak. And when he had this child, they were rebuking his wife saying, nobody has this name in your family. And his mouth is open. And he says, his name will be called John. We learn how to lead with humility. John teaches us a lot of lessons. And one of the things that you have to understand is that you are in a leadership role. Every person under the sound of my voice that watches this on, on the TV, on YouTube, every one of you are in leadership. Whether you believe that or not, you are in leadership. And I'm going to prove that to you at the end of this sermon. Because you have been given a commission. We talk to people. We influence people. So many people around us. If we would just take the time to get to know them. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go out with Joe Westmoreland. He and I went to one of my favorite places on the planet. We went to Top Hall. And we got some catfish and white beans and some whole cakes and some fruit tea. And I know y'all might be hungry, but I'm telling you right now, it was good, wasn't it, Joe? <laughs> but it don't last long enough. <laughs> you, you get full and you got to walk away. But as I sat there and I talked to Joe, I learned about Joe. I've always appreciated Joe because I know a little bit about his past. But as I got to talk about him with him.
to listen to him talk about himself and share some of the things, his experiences, some of the things that he's been through. Not only did I learn to love him more, but I learned to appreciate and respect him. Just because we were able to take a little bit of time with each other and sit down and eat a meal. Guys, this is what I'm telling you. We have influence and we need to use our influence to share the gospel. But more than anything, to let people know that we care and that we love them. But watch this. Leading with humility. humility. Matthew 3.11. This is what John is saying about Jesus. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now John was the stuff. He had a huge following. You need to understand that. He had a huge following. And you're going to understand even the king was upset with him. But he said, there's somebody that's coming. That's a whole lot more than I am. And as Christians, we need to learn how to humble ourselves before God. How to allow ourselves to back down and not think so highly of ourselves. It doesn't matter what you're capable of, what your finances are, what anything you can be or is or can do. Let's put it that way. It's irrelevant. I got to work with Chris a while back and, and watch him and just watch. And I was just amazed and how his carpentry skills are. I mean, I'm not kidding. He laid some stuff out. I mean, it's like back up and get out of the way and just watch this show. But I was amazed at how quickly he was able to do things. It gave me more respect for him. But what I learned about Chris was that he's unassuming. He's not trying to be, hey, everybody watch me. Everybody listen to what I got to say. Chris is a humble man, in my opinion. He really is. This is the same way John is here. He said, yes, I am this. This is what I am. This is what I do. But there's one much greater than I that's coming. Watch this. We have to live in purpose. Robert's small group study that they're doing is called Shape. And it's finding out what that purpose is, finding out what your shape is. How many of you know what your purpose is? I mean, you absolutely know what your purpose is. Or are you learning what your purpose is? Or are, you, are you finding that out a little bit every day and finding more and more about what you need to be and what you need to do and, and how you need to even act? When we learn to live in our purpose, we change lives. Not only ours, but those that are around us. Amen? Watch this. John 3 and 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. You see, what John was saying is, I am setting the stage. What his father said, he was going to pave a way. He blessed him so that he could make that way. He could make that happen. And then John says, he's got to increase and I've got to decrease. Little did he know how that was going to work out for him. Because we have to be prepared to speak the truth. I was watching something on, on Facebook and looking at, at people just going off on this uh, artist named Christian Dale, uh, uh, Lauren Dale. She's a Christian artist. And they were going off because she had an opportunity to uh, address a question that was asked her on a television show about homosexuality. And I watched as the right wing or the left wing or the middle wing or the no wings at all started attacking her because of her answer. And the first thing that came to me was I became angry because the way they were treating her. Now, you guys may do great in a public setting. You guys may be able to stand up in front of the whole nation on national television and answer any question truthfully about anything. You might be that person. I doubt it. I doubt it. And the very people that were attacking this person had no idea what that person had been through. But they sat back and they armchaired it. And Cam said it. People get on social media and they can be anything and anybody. 
They quote this, they quote that, and they act like they're all these kind of things. But the truth of the matter is, if you have to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody, what's your witness like? How much Jesus do you have in the tank? How far can you go with what you believe? Can you defend it? Can you stand up? Or are we to share love with people? Guys, this is what I have strived to teach you in the entire time that this church has been in existence. Forgiveness and love. Forgiveness and love. Forgiveness and love. Because we need to be forgiven. But more than that, we need to love. We need to accept people. I'm not saying that we condone their behavior. But surely we're not to condemn them. Jesus himself said, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Answer this question for me. How close will you get to a pious person? A person is, it's that, the church lady or the church man. You know what I'm talking about. That person that's always critical of every little thing. Oh, you don't understand. Blah, 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 blah. There, you just, mm -mm, you're not living right. You're not doing right. Don't you enjoy being in their company? It's just so wonderful. You just want to move in and get real close to them, don't you? Kind of, I do, because, you know, there's like that little, you know, see how far the eyeballs come out of their head kind of thing? Y'all aren't like that, though, right? Are you understanding what I'm telling you tonight? The day is coming, guys, and you better listen to what I'm saying. You better be prepared to speak the truth. But when you speak the truth, you better speak it in love. And you better not speak it in condemnation. Let me help you with something. Jesus, right before he's crucified, he's praying and he's overlooking Jerusalem. And he says these words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered you under my wings like a hen does her chicks, but you would not. Jesus is crying while he's looking at Jerusalem, knowing that these are the very people that are going to crucify him, but he's still praying for them. He's still loving them. He's still compassionate for them. Why? Because what he knew that they did not know when he prophesied and said, not one stone will be left upon another. When the war came to Jerusalem after Jesus' crucifixion, there were over, it was recorded by Josephus, that over a million people died. A million lives were lost. And there was nothing he could do about it because of the hardness of their hearts. So we must be able and be prepared to speak the truth. Now, watch this. Matthew 14, 4 and 5. And this is him talking to this king. He says, because John said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they had counted him as a prophet. Now, when he's speaking against this guy, he had taken his brother's wife and married her. And it was not lawful. And John said, hey, you can't do that. That's against the law. So this guy takes him and throws him into prison. Now, watch this. You need to understand and know that doubt will come. You ever second guess yourself? How many times have anybody, any of you stood up here that stood in front of anybody that's done anything where you had to get in front of somebody? Have you ever second guessed yourself after the fact? Do you ever say, man, I wish I'd have said this. I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd have done that. Man, I didn't do that right. Boy, I blew that. Every time I walk away from this podium, I think, man, I should have said this. I shouldn't have said that. Dummy, you talk too much. Oh, now you laugh. Okay, I got you. <clears throat> I love you too. But the truth is, doubt will come. It's going to come. And it's how your faith is that keeps you from standing or falling. Amen? Watch. Matthew 11. I want to read you guys something. This is Jesus. And he's talking about John. John has his disciples to come to Jesus. And this is how this plays out. Chapter 11, starting at verse 2. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, 
He sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And as they prepared, as they departed rather, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John. Now listen to what Jesus says about John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he for whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare a way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, I want to tell you guys something. You need to understand, we need more Johns today. We need more people who are standing up and making straight the path, who are not afraid to talk about Jesus. Guys, you need to understand, there's coming a day, and I'm telling you, it is not far away. You're going to be pressed. You're going to be tested on whether or not you got what you say you've got inside of you. You better get ready for it. I'm not playing games here, guys. I am waving the flag saying, get ready because it's coming. Watch. Be prepared. The truth has a high price. Matthew 14 and 8. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, give me the uh, John the Baptist's head on a platter. This is the daughter of the wife of the king. She tells him because she knows it's wrong too. The king's afraid to touch him. But she says, since you made all these promises, now you have to fulfill them. I want his head. And so his head was given. It is not an option. Watch this. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm telling you, you are all ministers. You are all part of a royal priesthood. When you accept Christ, that puts you as a joint heir with Christ. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yes. Jesus himself says, I have grafted you in. You're a joint heir. If you are a joint heir, that means that you are in line of the secession of the throne of God. Did you know that? Did you guys get how the, the throne thing works? Let's look at the natural world just for a minute. If the queen dies in England, one of her sons takes over, right? If that son dies, then one of the other sons takes over, right? If that son dies, then one of the other... Are you understanding that? So we are in a line of secession to the throne because we have been grafted in to the bloodline of Jesus. That's why he says... You are a royal priesthood. It's not just the pastor. It's not just the elder or the deacon. It's not that. It's you as a Christian have a responsibility to speak the truth and not be afraid. Amen all by myself. This is as real. I'm telling you as real as it's going to get. It's not an option. Go, 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 go. Now, let me help you with something. I was talking to Becky tonight about how that you never see her stand up here and talk, right? That she does this right here. She can fly with this, right? I got this. <laughs> <laughs> but you never see her stand up here and you do things like this. But what you don't know about her is what she does behind the scenes. Because when she gets one-on-one -on -one with somebody and she starts talking to them and sharing with them and befriending that person, they find that there's no greater friend to have than that girl. And that's the truth. There's somebody in particular in this room 
that she spent a lot of time with just talking to, befriending, not doing anything in particularly special, but just showing love. Is that fair to say? Just genuine love. And because of that, there's a wounded person that says, wait a minute, I haven't seen that kind of love. Let me look and see that. Let me check that out. And all of a sudden they find out, wow, this is real. I love this. This is what I've been looking for. All because somebody said, hi. That's all I'm talking about, guys. That's what I'm talking about. It's not going out and quoting the whole Bible to somebody. It's just about loving somebody enough to say hello. Having enough compassion on somebody when they're hurting to sit down beside them. This week I got a phone call. And it was right before I was going to start teaching a class. Literally about 45 minutes to an hour before I was scheduled to start teaching. And this person called me on the phone and they're bawling. And I said, what's going on, man? He said, I can't do it anymore. I said, what can't you do anymore? He said, I can't do this life thing anymore. He said, I'm going home. I'm sticking a shotgun in my mouth and I'm done. And he says, I probably caught you at a bad time. And I told him, I said, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing because I've got some things I've got to get going but I'm not going anywhere. Talk to me. After talking with him for about 30 to 45 minutes, I got a contract with him. And if you get involved in that kind of world, you, get, you understand that it's important to get their word on a subject because that's a contract and give them that hope to get them through that moment of time. He gave me a contract and he promised me that he would call me in the morning. And he would call me for sure before he ever did anything. And I said, are you a liar? That sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? But you need to understand that kind of situation, it's not time to play games. All the sugar coating and the candy coating, that's gone. We got to be real. I said, are you a liar? He said, no, sir, I am not. I said, I believe you and I trust you and I'm going to accept your word. Do you promise that you'll call me? He said, yes, Howie, I promise I'll call you talked to him not only the next day but the day following that and I'm telling you all you have to be is available amen, amen. just be available reward versus risk watch this this is I love this Matthew 25 and 21 his Lord said to him well done good and faithful servant you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Guys, if you don't let go, if you don't give up, you will see the reward. If you do not reject the name of your Savior, you will see him face to face and hear these words. They're not written for nothing. This is a promise. Everybody still with me? Watch this. What is God's will? That's a good question, isn't it? 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. We just talked about promises right before this one, right? As some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus doesn't want anybody to die. God doesn't want anybody to die. He saved us so that we could save others. Are you getting it? I was talking to one of my police officers last week and he said that he went to a call and a woman had been trapped. She, an elderly woman had fallen in between her bathtub and her commode and she was stuck. And her head was literally stuck and she had been laying there for about six days. He was able to get into that house because somebody said, something's not right, we can't get in touch with her. He went in and she was not far from gone. I don't know how she made it. I, I'm not God. All I know is that that officer was able to go in and render aid to that helpless woman that was stuck. Guys, how many of you have been stuck? How many of you have 
How many of you have been trapped just by common circumstances like a fall? Just a little slip, just a little, and you get in a place where you can't get yourself out of it. Call on the name of Jesus. He says, if you will feel for me, you'll find that I am not very far. We've got to trust God. Amen? Amen. Will the price be paid be worth it? Will the price paid be worth it? I thought about this, and as I looked it up in Scripture, it blew my mind because there's a song that goes along with this, but I want to read what the Scripture says. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. After these things, this is John, the beloved speaking. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Do you understand how powerful one act of love can be? A number that could not be numbered were in white robes. These are those that made it. Are you understanding that? These are the ones that made it. And as we're part of that number and we look around and we see all the people that are there. Every nation, tongue, tribe, everything, everywhere. They're all there. Some we're going to be shocked. Some are going to be shocked that you got there too. I know they're going to be shocked I got there. But we're going to stand there and be part of a number because somebody loved us as an individual enough to share Jesus, not in a critical way, but to show the love that Jesus actually has. The love that God has for us and show us that love with compassion, not judgment. I feel sorry for people who have been beat up by religion, who've been beat up by well-meaning people sometimes. I feel sorry for them because they walk around with wounds that don't heal until they meet Jesus. Guys, I said this before. In studying the scripture, the Bible tells us to be fishers of men. That's a true statement. But nowhere in scripture does it say that we are to be cleaners of men. We are not called to clean them. We're called to compel them and to bring them in. We let God clean them. It's the washing of the water by the word. It's the word of God. It's Jesus' blood that cleans somebody. Not you or your dogmatic position or your theology or anything else cleans anybody. It's the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone. And the blood of Jesus plus anything is a lie. You can believe that or not. But it's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus. He's the only one that hung on the cross. It's not Jesus plus this church. It's not Jesus plus this organization. It's not Jesus plus City Gate. It's Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Be a modern day John the Baptist. <laughs> Go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Go out and don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't be scared. Don't do it. Because the Bible says this. There is no law against love. Love people, guys. I'm telling you, love people. Have compassion on them. <clears throat> I wasn't going to say anything about this until after the first of the year, but I'm going to I'm going to bring it up. We just got some paperwork from the state. We've just become a recovery group recognized as a state. This church has become one of those churches. We want to help people recover. How many of you are recovering from life? 
I'm not talking about drugs and alcohol. How many of you come from recovering from pain, from hurt, from aggravation, from sorrow, from drugs, from alcohol, from anything? You're recovering from life. That's what that means. And we're going to help people recover. The motto of our church, if you look on our website and you see it says, bring, heal, train, and sin. Why do we have that on there? Why is that even part of the, our motto? Why is it part of our church? Because we bring people so that they can heal. We're not healing them. God is healing them. And while they're here, we train them. We train them in this, the word. So that we can send them so that they can bring, so that others can heal, so that they can be trained, so that they can be sent. It's not about city gate. It's about the word. We're going to be a people that helps people. We've proven that, have we not? This community recognizes us as a giving church. I want it to recognize us as a loving church, as a caring church, as a compassionate church. Because I know each one of you in this room. I know you personally. From one level or another, I know you personally. And I know each and every person in this room cares. Amen. This is a caring church. It's a loving church. Let's make a difference in people's lives. As we prepare for 2019, let's go into the highways and the hedges. Let's get people. Let's bring them here. It's not about growing the numbers of this church, guys. I could care less about that. I want souls saved. I want people to come in the doors of this church and heal from whatever they're dealing with. I don't care what it's been. It doesn't matter what it's been. I'm not going to judge that person. Listen, we don't condemn, but we don't have to condone. We have to love. That's what we're going to do, and that's what we are. That's who we are. Let's love. Every person that walks in that door, like you do so well. I love to watch what goes on at the back door of this school. I prayed for this school and I prayed for Mr. Malone and Mr. Bob when I pulled up. I thank God for them today. When I pulled up in this parking lot, I thank God for them. I thank God for this place. I thank God for this school. Guys, you need to thank God for it. It's a blessing, it's a gift. God is allowing us to do great things, and we're going to do greater things than we've seen so far. But we're not going to do it out of judgment and condemnation. We're going to do it out of love and compassion. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you, Lord, that we are a church that loves, and we are a church that cares. I pray, Father, because your church universal is a church that loves. You are love, Father, and you tell us to love one another. Help us today, Father, if there's someone under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you would pull on their heartstrings, that you would talk to them right now, that you would allow them to accept you as Lord and Savior. Forgive us of our trespasses and our sins, God against you forgive us father for falling short but thank you for second chances and third and fourth and fifth chances lord give us the courage and the strength to stand when we need to help us to be a modern day john the baptist help us father to be able to say the name of jesus and to lead lost souls to the light that is in your word bless us and keep us father each and every one I thank you for the day. And it's all in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you all so much for being here. Don't forget Wednesday night at uh, 6.30 Robert Susan's house. They're still working on Shape. That's a good program. I've been through it myself. You'll love it. Uh, our class is Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it is at 6.30 to 9.30. This class is on the 11th, Tuesday the 11th. This is week three. We only have two classes left. So if you want to come and you want to listen to it, come on. We'd love to have you. Don't forget our Christmas communion service as well as our dinner that follows that. It's going to be a great time. That's going to be on the 22nd. Have a great week. God bless you. I love each and every one of you.